I was 13 years old when I first fell in love. Not with a person, but with the music of Chopin. My piano teacher assigned me the B major prelude, and I wasn't really sure how it was supposed to go. So I found a recording of it played by Arthur Rubenstein in my dad's CD collection. Then this happened. Pause. Let's rewind that, because it goes by fast. That's all it took. Four bars of music lasting no more than six seconds, and I was head over heels. Now, we never really know exactly why we fall in love, but later on I realized that those four bars of Chopin included a fragment of the famously tempting Paco Bell progression. Listen again, and this time I'll play along with the bass. Down a fourth, up a step, down a fourth, and so on. This makes sense to me, considering that I fell asleep every night as a small child to the sound of Pachelbel's cannon accompanied by ocean sounds. But whatever the reasons behind it, Rubinstein's magical little B major prelude changed my life. It sparked an obsession with Chopin and other great composers that led me to pursue a career in classical piano. Now, 25 years later, and all I want to do is share a little bit of that magic I felt with you. Welcome to the Chopin Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Lottie, and over the course of this 12-part series, we'll be diving deep into the music of Friedrich Chopin, with one episode dedicated to each of Chopin's major compositional genres. This is episode one, Preludes. In this episode, pianist Georg Olsen takes us on a tour of the 24 Preludes, Biographer Alan Walker tells the story of Chopin's death-defying efforts to compose them, and music critic Judd Distler recommends his favorite recordings of the preludes from the past century. You can listen to full episodes of the Chopin podcast on all major podcasting platforms the day of release, or watch video segments from each episode in the following days as they're posted to my YouTube channel. Just look up my name, Ben Lottie. That's B-E-N-L-A-U-D-E. This podcast is produced in partnership with the Chopin Foundation of the United States, dedicated to the proliferation of Chopin's music in America and around the world, and which has for 50 years presented the National Chopin Competition in Miami, Florida. The honorary chairman of the U.S. Chopin Foundation is none other than Garrick Olson, who will be with us every step of the way during this podcast series. To this day, Garrick is the only American ever to win first prize at the International Chopin Competition And the release of this episode marks exactly one year until the next Chopin competition in Warsaw, where Garrick will become the first ever non-Pole to chair the jury. Garrick is one of the few pianists in history to have recorded Chopin's complete works published on the Hyperion label. Throughout this series, you'll be hearing recordings taken from this set, unless otherwise specified. Digital downloads of the complete cycle are available for purchase on the Hyperion website. But long before he became a prolific recording artist himself, Garrick Olson was just a kid in a record store flipping through LPs when an album of the Chopin Preludes caught his eye. Speaking of Rubinstein, it was a very important thing for me. It was my first classical piano recording that I bought myself. I remember when I was nine, my mother took me to the record store and I chose the Rubinstein Preludes, Opus 28, on an LP, which had a very big bubblegum pink surround covering a very small label of Rubenstein Chopin Brilliance. I don't know why I chose it. I just, of the four or five things I was allowed to hear at age nine, that's what I liked. And I was very impressed with the opening Brilliance somehow. It just, it thrilled me. By that point, I don't mean to say I was more precocious than you, but I had been very moved by by music a great deal at that point Garrett, in my life. I think we can all say you were more precocious than me at age possibly. nine. Uh, yeah, possibly. Um, so it was that first C major prelude that spoke to you. Yeah, well, it was just this wash of color and sound, and I have to admit, some of the others were really tough going when I was nine years old, particularly number two. I 
I didn't know why that wasn't nearly as nice, but then number three was fast and that was nice again. And number four was so famous I had heard it already. So I didn't know what a prelude was. I knew who Chopin was. That's about it. Some would say Chopin didn't know what a prelude was because preludes historically were meant to uh, come before a larger work. And yet here we are with 24 preludes, which are all just preludes to the next prelude, it seems like, if you at least if you play them in order. So Chopin wrote 24 preludes, opus 28, one in each of all the major and minor keys. And I want to begin with one of uh, Chopin's favorite keys, A flat major. The prelude number 17 in A flat was one of the favorites of Chopin's contemporaries. Uh, Robert and Clara Schumann adored it. Ignaz Moscheles and his entire family, including his daughter, who once actually brought the piece to Chopin to play for him, loved this piece. And also Felix Mendelssohn adored it so much. He said, I love it. I cannot tell you how much or why, <laughs> except perhaps that it is something which uh, I could never have written at all says Mendelssohn. Could you talk a little bit about this prelude, uh, how you feel about it and what, what your sort of thoughts are on it? This one is one of the lengthy ones. It's got a funny kind of texture. It's got a a bass accompaniment, then it has a lot of chunky chords in the middle. Which every pianist knows is a is part of the difficulty of playing the piano, is that whenever you strike the same note again, it gets louder. And there's a melody on top of it, uh, which is one note against four in this case. If you're a young pianist, you might fall into the hard, bad habit of playing them all the same. And you like the sound of that very much. So it's it's something you have to navigate. Um, it's very funny that Mendelssohn said he couldn't int have written it himself. I think if it's one of Chopin's more Mendelssohnian pieces, if it had been called Song Without Words, I would have thought, yeah, of course. <laughs> Alfred Cortot, I, I know that you're not fond of these kind of this sort of imagery, but, uh, you know, Cortot had a sort of a saying for each of these preludes. And for this one, it was, she told me, I love you. <laughs> and in any case, it does feel like love is in the air with this piece. And there's something yes. about this. There's a very striking kind of symbol that Chopin had in mind. And I thought we could play a little game, Garrick. I'm going to read actually a document from... Ignatian Paderewski, who had a conversation with one of Chopin's favorite pupils, Madame Camille Dubois, about a lesson she once had as a teenager with Chopin on this piece. And here is Paderewski relating this conversation with Madame Dubois. Chopin himself used to play that bass note in the final section with great strength, in spite of playing everything else diminuendo. He accentuated that bass note, he proclaimed it, because the idea of that prelude it is said, is based on the sound of an old clock in the castle which strikes the 11th hour. Madame Dubois told me that I should not make that note diminuendo as I intended in accordance with the right hand which plays diminuendo continually, but said that Chopin always insisted the bass note should be struck with the same strength, no diminuendo, because the clock knows no diminuendo. That bass note was the clock speaking. Garrick, what do you make of that testimony? And do you think you could... Uh, Share share a little demonstration with us. I'm happy to demonstrate it. The difference is this. If you play it loud, and if you play it more musically, more correctly, as many people will, a discreet little chime. Because after all, Schumpen is so refined, he wouldn't want a real... <laughs> but of course, his, his pupil claims otherwise. He wrote otherwise. But um, very often we're called crude. And in, in fact, even reviewers in newspapers have called me crude when I played it in public. That was it. Mr. Olsen played marvelous, but except for this dreadful lapse in taste. So you did do it Chopin's way without without knowing it in a without way. Without I mean, knowing it, it, yes. I mean, I've, I've done it various ways because I've mm -hmm. heard various... Excellent people play it in various ways, but I'm most happy with the, with the clocks. Let's stay on A-flat, but we're going to call it G-sharp. Okay, can I ask you to turn to the G-sharp minor yeah. prelude yes, number 12? Yes, with great pleasure. And just 
maybe tell us what you see. Here, I've got the manuscript. If you look at the first page, there are one, two, three, four, five major places, sometimes a bar long, sometimes two bars long, where he's wiped it all out very firmly so that you really can't see what was there before. We sort of associate that more with Beethoven. Yes, his handwriting is usually pretty elegant to exquisite and very precise and very finely drawn. And then there's this Beethovenian slash that's very interesting. And the piece, of course, is full of violence. I wouldn't say it's Beethovenian, but yes. I just think it's interesting that this is a, you know, a traditionally improvised genre. The, you know, the the history of preluding is one of of keyboardists uh, sitting down and sort of just extemporizing on the spot before a larger work, and that's where the that's prelude right. came from. And yet here we are, where here we have the opposite of that. I mean, we have a very carefully composed prelude. So I just think those those scratch outs are are interesting in the context of this prelude genre because of course Chopin could improvise but yeah these are preludes but I don't think he used them that way and you know what an impeccable um craftsman he was with his work so he didn't he didn't want to leave something imprecise and I, I would just like to add at this point I think for me one of the most important things about these preludes is that many people including me have have played them as a cycle and some people just play bits and pieces. But it's typical of Chopin, who was also an improviser, as were Mozart and Beethoven and many others, and Liszt, that sometimes one prelude leads very logically to the next. For example, the end of the G major number three. Those two chords in the right hand become of the relative minor. Now, if you want to get really geeky, which I always like to do, you could say that in the next prelude, which doesn't sound so obviously related, he makes a special stemming, which is not unlike the tune of the previous prelude. It's the same pitches almost. So maybe that's a connection, but I don't know. Not only that, but the very next prelude after that is in B minor with those very Bs being repeated right. in the very top. But then number seven, I can't find any relationship. One of the most famous ones, you see. So speaking of one going to the next, I was engaging uh, in conversation with a YouTube commenter, which I often find myself doing. Uh, and this commenter on your wonderful innovations video, where you break down 16 of Chopin's most transformative um, ideas at the piano, he says he always thought that the E flat at the end of the F major prelude on, on some level created a harmony that led to the D minor prelude. And yet, it's not a dominant of D minor at all. Uh, maybe no. the E flat falls to D. It's actually a, a rather strange harmonic progression to go from F dominant to D. Yeah, with respect to whoever the commentator was, I have heard that in other contexts before from writers on Chopin that somehow. But it creates a disturbance in the force, certainly. And you know, it was said that Mozart, if you played a five-seven chord, uh, if he was sleeping, he'd have to get out of bed to resolve it because, well, it's a physical need as well as an emotional oral need, right? It's it's got to go there. It's got to go somewhere, and that would have to go to to B flat or B flat minor. I do agree with your commentator that there, it if especially if you're playing the whole thing, all 24 as a cycle, yes, it sort of creates this need. And when you're playing this, you just know something has to happen, even if you're taking time. It builds up an emotional tension, if you will, or whatever. I don't know, but maybe he just particularly liked the color of that. I don't know. 
but it's certainly probably what likely the first time in music history a major composer ends with an unresolved dissonance. Well, it's funny. It's, if anything, it, com- it harkens back to the tradition of preluding because often a, a, a little extemporized prelude would end with a lack of closure, a sense yeah. of something needs to come next. And that brings up something else because sometimes people ask me if I improvise and I say, no, I don't know how. And they say, what do you mean? Well, actually, improvisations in the musical disciplines where they're still used You're taught how to improvise. In other words, I think it's been pointed out that every pianist in the time of Mozart, Beethoven, and even Chopin had yards of passage work they could just fit into anything they were doing because the whole idea, of we think in the modern ideas, you're improvising. Oh, you're inspirationalizing. You're just, you're so, you're so good. You're just making it all up on the spot. Well, I I don't know. I think even major geniuses sometimes need a little filler that they can count on as they go to the next idea. I anyway, I'll stay out of that one. No, they are, all these composers had uh, a grammar for for improvisation, very yeah. clear models that they learned, and, and we know that Chopin learned many of those with Elsner as a exactly. As a child. And, we, and we as modern pianists have virtually lost that inheritance entirely. Regrettably, although um, I'll name drop one, Noam Sivan, who's a fantastic historical improviser and is able to just sit down and play a Chopin nocturne that you've never heard before because he made it up. Speaking of Bach, you mentioned the C major Chopin prelude was sort of the first one that caught your ear when you put on that Rubinstein record. I thought maybe you could share with us the, the Bachian sort of elements you know, in that piece and, and maybe compare it to the very first prelude of, of Bach's. Oh, of course. Um, This is a very important point for Chopin. Basically, in every work of Bach, not every work he wrote is a chorale, but there's an underlying, usually four-part chorale voice structure. You can reduce it to voices. So on. And so, in other words, you could say there, there's this underlying chorale. Let's let's say, you know, a soft chorale of people humming that harmony and the keyboard is, they're humming that and... And as we know, um, who wrote the Ave Maria? Sanson? Gounod. Gounod. Right, sorry. He just turned that into a soprano melody. And you can pick out individual melodies in, in these voices. But Chopin's first prelude, partially, starts with a version of that. Because I could put the underplaying. So it has that extra little syncopated voice. But after all, it's not Bach anymore. We're in the... We're in the early part of the 19th century, and things like that were being done all the time expressively. What makes this particularly successful is a remarkably simple but inspired voicing where he just doubles. He doubles the uh, alto or tenor tune. makes a remarkably beautiful piano tex- texture, you know, played, of course, with pedal, which Bach wouldn't have known about. So I, I think the relation is pretty clear. And it gives the pianist a choice whether to accentuate the thumb line right. or the top line. I know that Corto loved the thumb line. But usually you hear the sort of top voice uh, yeah, brought up usually, in many recordings. I mean, Chopin didn't tell us definitively. He doesn't say to play one louder than the other. So I think you have a choice. You 
you can vary it. And that's part of the magic of romantic pianism, which, of course, Chopin knew all about. And it got even developed after him that, you know, you can bring out different voices at different times. So this is, in a way, we could call it a, a figuration prelude in the yeah. tradition of Bach. And there's there's other figuration preludes among Chopin's 24. I think maybe one of the most striking is the F-sharp minor, number eight. Yeah, this is exceedingly complex compared to the first prelude, but it seems to be, in a way, related in its in its structure because you have... A melody which never changes its rhythmic shape through the whole piece. But anyway, that's the first bar. And then he immediately doubles the thumb, which here is very clearly written in big notes. And then the small notes. So it would never be. never be a top note exercise what the what the octave does is just just as a beautiful um sonorous reinforcement but then there are four notes in the middle which complicate things immensely because they're they're non-melodic there and two of them are non-harmonic because if you think of this create an amazing uh, sound color and an emotional tension because especially the dissonant one creates a set. I mean, if it were... It would be kind of ordinary, whereas it's... There's this, com there's this harmonic comment, which is not dominant, but it's clearly there. It's an undertow that you feel. Um, so it's, it's, by the way, it's, it's, terrifically difficult to play too by the way and 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 even though the prelude itself lasts about a minute and a half it's quite a tiring exercise for the right hand it contains one of my favorite moments in the entire 24 and that's towards the end there's this glimmer of hope this turn to major f sharp major and you think we're going to end there and damn it, we don't. I wonder if you could share yes, that ending with that's us. That's one of my favorite moments. I'd also like to add at this point, almost each prelude writes a moment of, usually toward the end like this, it's like, this is really what the story is about. In other words, this is what this is what all the tumult of the preceding minute has led us to. We've calmed down. And now we're sort of... we. The major drama of the piece is over, and in this coda, he sort of tells the real story. And I'll, I'll let me just play it right now. Something like that. Um, uh, but in other words, it, it does veer to the major, but it's it's resigned. After all the furious tumult of this piece before, let me just give you two quick examples. This is somewhat furious. That's furious enough. And then the climax is really almost 20th century. have major upset here going on harmonically rhythmically emotionally everything and finally uh, it's a sad story but here's your hope uh, maybe maybe it'll be a happy ending but it's not it's clear that uh, chopin was probably listening to the Mahler sixth symphony which has course, a big yeah. thing yeah and 
It's also evident he was listening to Rachmaninoff's third concerto, whose first movement cadenza at the end, when the flute comes in, sounds a heck of a lot like this figuration. Very but, much so. It's the same kind of... This is, this is a beautiful example of how composers tip their hats to each other without copying them. Not identical in notes, but identical in the mechanisms, the, the structural way it's been evolved and sounds so marvelous, yes. Another composer who loved this particular prelude was Franz Liszt. And in uh, his writings on Chopin, he actually refers to this piece as the raindrop prelude. This is, Liszt calls really? this one. Yes, although I think of it, <laughs> it sounds to me more like a downpour or a rainstorm. The Preludes have been a special part of the competition repertoire in Warsaw and will be again in 2025. And since the U.S. national competition follows the same repertoire requirements, you can hear a prelude of the Preludes performed in Miami in January by America's most talented young Chopin players. The top two U.S. prize winners will earn automatic admission to the main rounds of the international Chopin competition in Warsaw in October 2025. Winners of the U.S. National Chopin Competition have regularly advanced to the semifinal and final rounds in Warsaw in past decades, and many of them appear in different episodes of this podcast series to revisit and react to their competition performances. That includes 2015 fourth prize winner Eric Liu, 1995 third prize winner Gabriela Montero, and 1990 top prize winner Kevin Kenner. In January 2025, every round of the National Chopin Competition will be live-streamed and hosted by yours truly. So make sure to subscribe to the Chopin Foundation YouTube channel where the performances will be broadcast, and enable notifications so that you don't miss a moment from the Miami Competition. On that note, maybe we could discuss a little bit of this famous raindrop prelude number 15 in D-flat, one of the most favorite compositions of Chopin, of piano in general, and maybe you could just speak to some of its ingenious qualities. Well, there are too many to get into right now, but number one is the fact that it has almost a pedal point unvaried, which is almost a 20th century idea. you don't play it that way but it's just it's not unconscious but it's relatively low in the level of consciousness in the whole piece because you have a beautiful tune to it. whereas if it had been a sort of normal accompaniment You know, it, it would be quite ordinary. So the, so the genius of this piece is not only its fine tune, but, uh, you know, the way he has, has set it up. Um, so it's very prominent. The most major stroke of genius in the piece is that it's, it's an ABA form with a very dark and very powerful middle section, which goes from pianissimo to fortissimo. He drifts off to sleep without resolution for the last time here.
I guess not. We get the resolution down here. With this really very dark if you will, almost sort of Slavonic chorale, um, we suddenly feel like we're not quite in, you know, Vienna or Paris anymore with music like this. And it, this, this becomes more, uh, this pedal point and repetition becomes more steady and ominous as it grows. And it, there's a big crescendo. And at the climax of it, very dramatically, he changes. He changes the note to there, so it's a. And it's it's a, it's an unbelievably powerful emotional moment, which he does again. He repeats it, so he really really wants you to get the idea. Then, after that, he writes a coda to that chorale, which is one of the many most poignant things he ever wrote. After it comes, and And, and then varies it again and makes it even more poignant, after which he lets that die away, and then he finally gets back to the opening gentle melody. And this is one of those stunning moments we'll come to in a Chopin, say, the C-sharp minor uh, Nocturne Opus 27, number one, or the F major, where the absolute, almost placid, pastel beauty of the opening is revealed to have been hovering over a very dark, deep abyss of possible tragedy or the deepest, most awful feelings. So in other words, the, na the actual nature of the piece hasn't changed when he brings back the theme, but the feeling for the listener is that, and suddenly this becomes, even if it's not emphasized, it's like, oh my God, it's, it's, it's still there. It wasn't just pretty. I think this is one of the possibly tragic pieces which end in major keys. One thing I would just like to add quickly, since we've touched on only briefly, is morbidness. These preludes contain some of Chopin's weirdest pieces. For example, if I played just this... said it was a newly discovered dirge by Bartok, you would you wouldn't you'd say sure. I mean it's it's such dissonances uh, this is from the composer of the prettiest music. So the second is full of morbidity. This the fourth the E minor is very sad. The sixth is very sad. You mentioned morbidity. I would add um, wild and strange. Those are quotes of Schumann. Yes. Who called these preludes remarkable, but using the German merkwürdig, uh, in which yeah. uh, it carries the connotation of strangeness. He says, I confess I imagined them differently and designed in the grandest style, like his etudes. This is in a review that Schumann, Robert Schumann wrote of the preludes. And he says, it's almost the opposite. They are sketches, beginning of etudes, or so to speak, ruins, individual eagle pinions, all disorder and wild confusion. In many ways, the, the preludes get harder as they go on, it seems, or at least they get wilder and there's a lot of dramatic things that happen. Yes. And maybe some evidence of this is in actually the Chopin competition. I will speak both of the international one in Warsaw and, and also those that feed into it, most notably the um, U.S. national Chopin competition in Miami. Uh, when they require the preludes in this upcoming year, 2025, uh, they require them in groups of six, and you get to choose in the second round. But here are the groups of six you can choose from. Seven through 12, 
13 through 18 or 19 through 24. You can't choose one through six. I think the reason is obvious. It, one through six does not contain one of these extremely fast, you know, pas- impassioned, uh, almost etude like, yeah. whereas the other groups of six do. The other groups all contain a, one or two monster virtuoso etude, uh, preludes, you know, which are etude like in some respects. The virtuoso one from 13 through 18 is, of course, the B flat minor number 16. <laughs> You recall that Schumann also said that in the B flat minor sonata, he didn't write a sonata but put, put together four of his wildest children. The B flat minor sonata uh, and this prelude have a certain relationship with the opening, not direct, but in their kind of wild, headlong impetuousness. As my teacher Irma Volpe said, yeah, the Tatar is riding on their horses in a very scary way, invading that part of Europe. Uh, <laughs> So the difficulty, the right hand is obviously fiercely difficult. Uh, And I can't play it today very well, but that's the idea. And the left hand is just as horrible. It gets bigger. And so on. For Chopin, it's quite awkward. Things like this. Those things, Chopin, even when he's hard, often lies organically, but it's quite tiring on the right hand. Another thing to look at, which most people don't do, is the pedalings in both of those pieces. In the B-flat minus sonata, when this starts, three bars on one pedal. Or, now pedals with each harmony. So you hear the jaggedness of the harmony, whereas you usually hear I mean, good pianists play it better than that, but just kind of this constant rhythm. And the same thing with this prelude. In the opening, he writes a pedal for three uh, bars, which creates a tremendous howl of the noise. And then later, he actually gives you much shorter things. So it, it, it's actually quite effective. <laughs> more or less that's <laughs> i'm just trying to convey the idea but otherwise it sounds like it's all the same once again good pianists will play it better than that but still you know he has an idea involved whether you can carry that out or want to i don't know Speaking of hard, <laughs> the yes. D minor prelude is very hard. Also has a kind of jumpy left hand and uh, very different, yeah, different thing going on. But um, what a striking piece that often I've, I've heard played as an encore, standing alone. Yeah, um, why almost not? like a concert concert prelude, which is a genre he sort of invented uh, in a way with with pieces like this one. Yeah. He gives you in his manuscript a very interesting clue as to how to play it. He puts a stem on the A. The figure is this. D, A, F, D, A, with a jump of a, what is that, a a twelfth, right? Obviously, getting down is no problem, but getting up is not so easy. But it's interesting that he he puts the stem on the A. And I think that's not so much of a musical thing that you're supposed to... I think it's it's just to tell you how to navigate the thing. So in other words, you have a pivot. It's a way to make the hands bigger. That makes it a lot more possible, and it shows you how to practice it and how to learn it. It's still awfully hard.
What's also awfully hard, um, I mean, not only does a piano student need to make sure that your scales are very brilliant, there's some very brilliant scales in this, very dramatic scales. But also the scale and double notes that come screaming down. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a roller coaster, Garrick. But um, yes. this is what it feels like when you're rushing down, uh, you know, the very first drop, I think. Yeah, it is really a terrible thing for the pianist because this is. Yeah. And you've still got this going on. It is it is a terrible moment in life and you need have to practice that a lot. If it sounds connected, that's good enough. You don't have to actually. If, if you're just listening, uh, Garrick is pretending to be a pianist, attempting to play that all legato, yeah. and well, you, you have to you see can. it to, to see that. <laughs> that was pretty good for a first effort. What the ear needs to hear, I'll play them all staccato with two hands. So what are you going to do when somebody sound, sounds that good on that scale? Are you going to say, he's not playing it legato? No. What the ear needs to hear is the connection of sounds. You know, legato, I've said this about a million times, probably to you too. If I play, um, if I play a scale like a D, a D minor scale, if I play it legato but every note different volume, it's not going to sound legato. Well, that was legato, whereas is not, and yet you hear eight notes in a row that match. And how about those final Ds? I don't, can't think of another piece of music by any composer that ends like this. No. I mean, I think you would have been slapped on the wrist if you take this into a composition lesson. I think, yeah, I think this is completely unacceptable on all levels <laughs> <It's> <laughs> uh, in, in proper music teaching. He ends the piece with a huge scale down in D minor, except it's got the minor six in there. And, and there are three accented Ds at the bottom, and they're just really like hammer strokes. So let me just play it first. Uh... It's, it's pretty amazing. Now, I, I know that um, one or two of my colleagues who've watched me play that in public and said, how do you, how did you do that so confidently? I, well, I figured out you have to have a system because I, like many virtuoso pianists, have lost concentration at that point after playing 24 preludes, and sometimes you play a wrong note very loud. And that's the last thing you want to do. It, it, it's really bad form. So I, I, and I'm happy to share, this is, this is a little trick. The first one you play with the left hand. So these, the left hand is there so you're safe, right? Then I, while the pedal is holding that, I lift my left hand and I, I press down all the white keys next to the D. And then I make a very big one, two, three out of my, and so I can really wonk it. And it looks like I'm hammering with an anvil very powerfully. And you actually get, you get the sound you want, and there's no danger of a smudge. It doesn't mess with the overtones because those are such low keys. Uh, no, and you the pet piano. the pedals down anyway. The dampers are up, so it wouldn't make any difference. And, Amazing. And it's, and Chopin says to use the pedal till the end. And so I think you basically turn a white key into a black key. By That's elevating right. it. That's right. See, you can't miss that unless you, you play. <laughs> yeah, you got to really, you got to really screw up to miss that. Yeah, uh, and wonderful. that gives you the hyper dramatic opportunity of bam, 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 which is what the music is expressing. It's this the last nail in the coffin or something. Except I don't know if they hammer sh coffin shut, shut like that. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphoric one. <laughs> in any case, it's an amazing moment. It's an amazing moment in, in music. This is a violent piece, yeah. Very passionate.
Every segment of the Chopin podcast with Garrick Olson and other special guests is cut from much longer interviews, which you can view in full by signing up to my Patreon. Consider joining any membership tier by visiting patreon.com slash Ben Lottie. On the next episode of the Chopin podcast, we will explore Chopin's most signature mood pieces, the Nocturnes. Starring, as always, Garrick Olson and featuring two special guests, pianists Dina Yaffa and John O'Connor. Stay tuned.